a problem, Pete Mumby. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> works. Thanks very much, Phil. Um, yeah, I'm going to be talking to you about extinction vulnerability in reef fish. Um, and uh, this has involved a number of uh, co-authors and collaborators from, that work mainly in the Indian Ocean region. So we all know there's been five uh, mass extinction events in the geological past, and there's growing support that we may be entering the sixth, or we li at least know that the rates of extinction of species on this planet are burgeoning. And with that comes a pressing need for predictive assessments of, ex of extinction risk before species are lost. There's been an assessment of marine animals um, and the average time from a species being lost and it being recorded as, as extinct is about 50 years at present. So the early attempts at predicting extinction um, included these three variables, geographical range size, occupancy within habitats and numerical rarity. And this formed the seminal uh, book chapter by Rabin Awitz, The uh, Seven Forms of Rarity. But since that time, our uh, knowledge of ecological versatility and life history traits of many organisms has greatly increased. And a lot of this information is now being incorporated into assessments of species extinction risk. Now, what I'm going to talk, to talk about the first half of this, uh, of this presentation is the extinction risk of fish to coral bleaching, which is a, a major pulse disturbance that we all know is occurring more and more frequently. Um, a healthy coral reef has high diversity. <laughs> um, uh, lots of uh, three-dimensional complexity high, um, and lots of niches for fish and other organisms to inhabit. So, as Betty pointed out, it's very good fish habitat, although we all know it's, uh, corals are very useful in their own right. <laughs> um, following a bleaching event, uh, although the live coral is lost very quickly, the three-dimensional structure can be maintained for some time. Um, and with that, a lot of the fish assemblage can be maintained in the short term, but with no recovery, um, we end up with a two-dimensional habitat uh, collapse of that, of, of that structure and, uh, and we lose a lot more fish. Now, there's been a great deal of work looking at the impacts of this coral and habitat loss on, on fish, a lot of it done by um, various people in this centre. And these are the four main um, aspects of, of ecological versatility and life history that are, have, are driving population declines. So the top left, diet specialization. Um, that slide hasn't come out very well, unfortunately, but this is data from before and after um, a major bleaching event in the Seychelles, uh, where in 1998, about 95% of the coral was lost. Uh, the bars represent um, fish, um, uh, crallivorous fish, the fish that feed on live coral, their density in 94 before the bleaching and in 2005 after the bleaching. Now, there should be three sets of uh, pairs of graphs there, and what it shows is that um, uh, the obligate coralivores, so, so those fish that are uh, highly specialized, will only feed on two or three species of coral, they showed a huge decline in abundance to the extent that we saw local extinctions in various species. The generalist obligate um, coralivores, we saw a very substantial decline, but no, no local losses. And the facultative coralivores that will take some algae and various invertebrates as well, we saw small, non-significant declines. And uh, Morgan Pratchett, as we all know, has done a lot of, uh, a lot of work along these lines as well, which uh, shows similar effects. Jeff Jones and colleagues, that we've already seen this plot today, um, found um, very substantial declines in fish following a loss of, of coral in Kimby Bay in Papua New Guinea. And, and they discovered that um, uh, up to 65% of the fish species will settle preferentially into coral uh, even if they don't use it as much as adults. And that was what correlated best with declines in, in abundance there. And there's been various other studies supporting this. Habitat specialization, this particular plot's by, work by Phil Monday, also in Papua New Guinea, uh, with increasing specialization, so the num number of specific coral colonies that different gobies will use, uh, in, so increasing specialization to the left, there was a greater declines in abundance, and Phil documented a local extinction there. Sean Wilson has done similar work on, on pomocentrids now and found very similar things. 
And body size has also come out as being very important. This was a study across the Indian Ocean, about seven different countries, and we found that one of the best predictors of declines in, in abundance in fish across that region following the 98 bleaching event was small body size. So the fish with, uh, that attained a maximum uh, size of below 20 centimetres showed a decline with, uh, with differential decline of coral across the region. But this information on dietary specialization, habitat specialization, settlement and body size really, really explains why, why uh, populations may decline in abundance. Whereas the earlier information on um, geographic range size, occupancy, numerical rarity, and in the case of uh, reef fish, depth range, really, um, really indicates whether those declines are likely to cause uh, species extinction. So with that, we can um, produce a bivariate, um, a predictive bivariate framework whereby we can, pl we can plot this likelihood of population decline um, against, uh, against the, these other variables uh, which, which dictate whether that decline is likely to be catastrophic and lead to extinction. So the worst place for a species to fall in this framework would be the top right-hand corner. Um, where they have a very high likelihood of, of very substantial population declines following this particular disturbance. And because they'll have a small geographic range size, occupancy, numerically rare, and restricted to shallow area, the shallow parts of reefs where uh, coral bleaching and many other disturbances are most severe, uh, there's a possibility that this will lead to global extinction. Species falling in the top left-hand corner, this is where we're more likely to see local extinctions, whereas across the geographic range um, and, and occupancy and, and depth range that the species occurs, there's unlikely to be a global loss, at least in the short to medium uh, outlook. Species falling in the bottom right-hand corner um, may be vulnerable to other disturbances or stochastic variation in their population sizes, and, and, and so there's some risk of extinction there, and the best place to fall is obviously the bottom left. So we actually assigned all this information to a range of coral reef fish using data collected by those authors across the Indian Ocean through the literature and through a lot of expert knowledge So many people in this room have contributed uh, and, and we, we aggregated these uh, weighted indexes. So for these 134 species of reef fish, uh, they fell into eight different functional groups. What we found was that the, um, the functional groups stratified by their climate vulnerability, their vulnerability to population decline following these bleaching events, and they didn't stratify with extinction risk, suggesting that no individual functional group is um, vulnerable to global extinction, although obligate coralivores uh, are, are clearly, as a, as a group as a whole, more vulnerable to local, local loss, whereby all species of, of the group could be lost locally. So obligate coralivores, facultative coralivores, planktivores and some microinvertebrate feeders appear to be the most vulnerable to population declines following these events, whereas um, various herbivore groups, or so scrapers and excavators, detritivores, roving grazers, and also the macroinvertebrate feeders appear to be the least vulnerable. Yeah. So the, the guy on the top, uh, the tubelet wrasse, uh, we predict it to be the most vulnerable to population declines in, in, in the assemblage that, that we've included. Um, the tubulet wrasse settles into, lives within, and feeds or only on live coral and often only on certain species of live coral, and it's got a small body size. However, it's got a large geographic range size. Um, it is numerically abundant when, it, when you find it in a location, and it's got a, um, a fairly decent depth range. So, we predict that local extinctions are more likely than global extinctions for this species, and indeed we documented a local loss of this species in the Seychelles in 2005. Petodon triangulum um, is also very specialized and has a small body size. However, this species is restricted to quite a small area of the Indian Ocean. It's got low occupancy and it's actually quite rare on the reefs where, where, where it does occur and it's restricted to the top 25 metres or so of the water column. So this species is, is of more risk to global loss into the future. We 
um, split up our um, population decline metric, the climate vulnerability metric, into the four different components. And we categorized species as, high vulner as, high, as highly vulnerable if they had a score above 0.7 on a scale to 1 um, uh, in this index. And that was that's supported by the, by the following slide I'll show in a moment. What we found was that 56 of those 134 species have got a high vulnerability to at least one of these um, different, different predictors. And 37% of, of, of the high vulnerability species uh, have multiple risks of population decline. And what's quite interesting, you'll notice that there's no species falling uh, that, that are only vulnerable through habitat specialization or dietary specialization. They always have another aspect of their, of their ecology um, that, that's affecting their vulnerability. And seven species uh, within the assemblage we looked at had, uh, were vulnerable through all four of these, uh, four of these different factors. Um, we assessed this uh, climate vulnerability um, index with the data we have from the inner Seychelles. It's a very powerful data set. Um, it covers the entire range of the inner islands of the Seychelles. Uh, the high level of replication, and this was an extremely severe uh, bleaching event, as I've already mentioned. And we found a strong negative relationship whereby the change in abundance of these species uh, was strongly correlated to the, uh, the, the metric that we produced for population decline, the climate vulnerability metric. Um, I'd like to point out that the, the y-axis, this is a standardized metric to, to take care of uh, skewness in the data, but a, a, a decline of, point of minus one represents a, a loss of over 60% uh, of the abundance of that species. So these are non-trivial declines. We then assessed on the next slide. Yeah. We then assessed on the next slide how the um, climate change vulnerability of these species related to their vulnerability through fishing and fisheries exploitation. And, and this, uh, this index is, uh, was the one that was produced by William Chung. Um, I'm sure many of you know, know his work. Uh, and, uh, he produced an excellent, uh, um, an excellent indicator of the vulnerability of different species to exploitation, which is uh, highly regarded as, as, it, as being the best out there at the moment. And when we compared the vulnerability of these species to climate change versus fishing, as you can see, we got this negative con, uh, concave relationship whereby species vulnerable, uh, vulnerable to uh, coral bleaching events are not vulnerable to, to fishing and vice versa. And this might seem like, a, like, like the best case scenario. So we're unlikely to see synergistic effects of these two disturbances at a species level. But at a community level, it's actually pretty much the worst, the worst case scenario uh, we could have had. And that's because climate change or coral bleaching events are taking out sp uh, species in the community from one end, and fishing, if it co-occurs with coral bleaching event, uh, is, is taking out species from the other end of, of the community. And as we all know, fishing and coral bleaching events are occurring together on most reefs around the world. So essentially, we're eating into the fish community from the bottom up and the top down. And I'd also like to point out that the, uh, uh, the shading there is, is hypothetical. So you can imagine a very severe bleaching event will take out many more species in that community, uh, and, and again, where fishing is heavy. What's slightly positive in, in this initial story is that because we have a non-linear relationship, there's quite a lot of species that fall in that bottom, bottom left-hand quadrant. And a lot of those are invertebrate feeding species. So if anyone wants to start working on goatfish, I think the future might be bright. However, this isn't a negative story. It's actually a very positive finding that we've got here. And that's because when you look at the functional groups and where they fall out in, in this particular plot, the important functional groups, the key functional groups on reefs, so a lot of the herbivores, the scrapers and the excavators, the roving uh, grazers, and the macro invertebrate feeders that control urchin populations and potentially uh, can control chronothorn starfish outbreaks as well. These species are aligned with the fishing vulnerability axis and not the climate, climate uh, or coral bleaching axis. And that's great information because it really lends um, 
energy and support for, for, for action, fisheries management action on coral reefs. Fishing is a local to regional problem, as we all know. Um, and there's, a, there's relatively fast responses to policy once, once they're implemented. So no take marine protected areas, we can see uh, recovery and responses of fish within, within decades. Uh, and, the, and the same with gear-based management and other kinds of management. It's obviously not without its problems, it's hugely challenging, but it's something that we can achieve um, and, and, and it's something we need to forge ahead and trying to achieve. Whereas climate change is a very complex global problem and any response to policy is going to be very, very slow and delayed and we're committed to future changes and future bleaching events. So I think the message really is that uh, by, by taking the actions to improve these functional groups, uh, that align with the fishing vulnerability axis, we, we can buy some time to tackle the more complex global problem that is climate change. Thank you very much.